There are so many ways to make airplanes safer. For example, they could have ejector seats so that every passenger could be rescued. In reality, though, it's way more difficult than it sounds. If there were ejector seats, your trip would be very different. Everyone would have to be strapped into a seat with a harness to make sure they wouldn't fall out of it. Then you would have to wear an oxygen mask all throughout the flight. An emergency can occur at any time. Then, ejection in itself is a big pressure on your body. Even fighter pilots who are physically prepared can still suffer severe injuries. For an average person, this process wouldn't be safe. So, however cool it sounds, ejection seats aren't very practical and are actually quite dangerous. Okay, well, at least they could have a parachute for each passenger. But this wouldn't be very useful either. Parachutes only sound like they can save many lives. First, having them isn't efficient. They're very costly and heavy. So a plane would need to burn more fuel while flying if there were parachutes on board. It would all be worth it, though, if parachutes could make an actual difference to the safety of people. But they can't. Commercial planes aren't designed in a way that would make it safe to jump out of them, especially with a couple hundred people on board. Next, passengers aren't trained to use them. Imagine there's an emergency. The plane is falling, and 200 people are trying to deal with a parachute for the first time in their lives. It would be an absolute mess. Lastly, it's not safe to jump from the high altitudes planes fly at. So, oxygen masks, life vests, and boats are the best life-saving equipment, and every plane has those. You know those huge engines that they have under the wings? Yeah, look at them. They don't look safe at all. Birds can get pulled in, and it actually happens. They could at least put a grate in front of the rotating parts to prevent birds from getting in there. Turns out those engines pull inside huge amounts of air, and this is crucial for them to work properly. The more air gets swallowed, the more air gets compressed, mixed with fuel, and burned. And then, more of it gets pushed out from the other side, keeping the plane going. A cover at the front would be a barrier, significantly reducing the air inflow that is crucial for the proper work of the engines. And this would endanger the passengers. But hey, don't be too upset. Birds fly way lower than planes do, so they're only in danger for a few minutes at the beginning of the flight while the plane is climbing altitude, and at the very end when the plane is landing. So very few of them ever get pulled in, and if they do, it's never a threat to the engines or passenger safety. Planes also don't change up the gears like cars do, so technically they can't go backwards. The reason for this is that planes don't need to go backwards. They can just turn around and move in the opposite direction, but face first. The only time when they need to move backward is when they have to get to the gate. And for those times, there's help. Pushback tractors. Those are small vehicles that can connect to airplanes and move them in the required direction. Watch out for those next time you fly. But technically speaking, planes can go backward if the engines start pushing the air forward instead of backward. But this is very dangerous for everyone around. One of the very few cases when they do it is during landing to help slow the airplane down. There are cameras on the outside that let pilots navigate taxiways better. They come in especially handy during tricky maneuvering. But do you know there are also cameras in airplane cabins? You can relax, there are no cameras in the lavatories. But yes, they are there in the cabin and for security reasons only. Flight attendants monitor them to see what's not visible from their own seats. Of course, flight attendants can check everything just by walking down the cabin, and that's exactly what they do most of the time. So, cameras are mostly used during takeoff and landing, when everyone, including flight attendants, is supposed to sit down, as those are the most dangerous stages of a flight. Notice that it's exactly during these stages that the rules are particularly strict. All electronic devices should be turned off or put on airplane mode, and big electronic devices should be stored away. Window blinds should be raised and tables folded. Seats should be put in the upright position. You need to have your seatbelt fastened, and so on. This is all done for safety and to ensure fast evacuation in case of emergency. So let's discuss these rules. 
Airplane mode on electronic devices is important to make sure that the signals that devices transmit don't interfere with the plane's electronic systems. If they interfere, they will block the radio's frequency pilots need to get their instructions. Do you remember that clicking sound a speaker makes right before your cell phone gets a call if the two devices are closed? This is the sound pilots might hear while communicating with air traffic control. Now, putting away large devices like laptops is important because they might turn into obstacles if you need to get out of the plane fast in case of an emergency. All the pathways should be as clear as possible. This is why everything should be packed away, seats straightened and tables folded. There should be nothing blocking anyone's way. And lastly, window blinds. The lights on the airplane get turned off too. Those two things are done to make sure your eyes get used to the natural light outside the aircraft. Imagine it's night, some emergency happens, and the lights that were left on suddenly go off. People need to evacuate as fast as possible, but their eyes aren't adjusted to the dark yet, and they can't see anything. This will slow everyone down. If the lights inside are out, people get used to the darkness and will be able to evacuate faster. The same goes for window blinds. If it's day and they are raised, people are used to the light outside and can evacuate faster. Another reason is that when blinds are raised during landing, people outside can see what's going on inside the plane. For example, if there's fire or smoke and where exactly. This way, they can plan the evacuation process better. Also, you might have noticed black triangles drawn above some windows on the airplane. These triangles mark the seats from which the view on the airplane's wings is the best. It's needed for the crew to find the spot as fast as possible if, in case of emergency, they need to inspect the engines, slats, or flaps. This little triangle saves the plane crew a lot of time. We do talk about emergencies a lot, but they really don't happen often. It's more dangerous to drive a car than to fly by plane, and most of us get in the car every day. Yet, the fear of flying is still very much out there, and people can get superstitious. In many cultures, the number 13 is considered unlucky. So, airplane companies that often fly to those destinations just omit row 13. It's a small thing to do but it can spare a few anxious passengers who happen to sit in row 13. In other cultures, like in Italy and Brazil, 17 is the unlucky number, and some aircraft have both rows 13 and 17 missing. In airplanes that fly to China, they can often omit row 14 instead. Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place. Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI powered in flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh, those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners Meet Sky Nest, a lie flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long-haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four-hour time slot if you want to take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie-flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature-controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days, airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins, and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind-boggling products. 
check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites or Air France's La Première Cabin, which is believed to become one of the best first class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience, especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye tracking equipment, the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi Fi. This way, Takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Qatar Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q Suites. It looks like this. On the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space. Or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys's air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. 
Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, these days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel. And at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades. And the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings, except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. 
they made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only open the doors once a day before people enter the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit… uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. 
contacts because they contact your eyes. Get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. A mechanic from Illinois was called out to tow a crashed vehicle. As he approached the upside-down Ford Ranger, suddenly he was struck with inspiration. Now, most people would only see a wrecked car, but this guy saw a whole new type of vehicle. He then took two pickups, a Ford Ranger and a Ford F-150. Then, he spent six months working on a strange new vehicle. With the two cars combined, he created the illusion that there was only one. With enough room for passengers, it's even legally approved to drive along the road. With the four wheels on top all spinning autonomously in line with the ones on the road, he creates confusion wherever he drives. Yeah, it looks quite weird even when perfectly parked. The importance of eating your greens is something many wholesale companies try to convey to their potential buyers. One company in England called Birdseye went to the next level. And they built a car in the shape of a pea to promote their product. Yeah. It's built on the chassis of an off-road go-kart, and it has many parts from a Volkswagen Beetle. It may look like a toy, but it's not. Equipped with a small Honda engine, this little zooming green pea can even reach 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, you won't see it anywhere on the road, as its only purpose was for a commercial. But it did gain a lot of fame from ads. Rumor has it, many people even inquired about how they could purchase this weird vehicle. In 1964, a small, lightweight Jeep called the Mini Moke was designed in the US. They offered it to Great Britain with the belief that it would suit their terrain. Still, the car was rejected for its low ground clearance, and the open side doors weren't quite adapted for the English weather. It was further offered to warmer climates in Portugal and Australia. Ooh. The idea was that it could be used for tourism, and it could be an easy way to travel around. But without any other use for fun activities like four-wheel driving, it lost popularity. Still, with the introduction of electric engines, it's making a comeback. Well, it's no surprise, the clearance now is higher, the seats are more comfortable, oh, yeah. and the price is quite affordable too. The car costs about $21,000. In the early 20th century, cars began to rule the streets. Some of them were steam-powered, but that was far too noisy. There were even electric vehicles, but as they couldn't be powered outside of cities, they also failed to catch on. But there was another, stranger design. In the early 1920s, the Layout Helica was invented. It was also called the plane with no wings. In this car, the driver sits in the front, with one passenger seated behind. Yeah. The aerodynamic body of Layat Helica is structured similarly to a plane. It's mostly made from plywood, with a large propeller on the front to push the car forwards. The designer believed that all the added weight from normal car parts added unnecessary weight. At the time, steel was incredibly important for other uses, and the lightweight frame was his solution. Weighing about 550 pounds, this vehicle could reach speeds up to 106 miles per hour. That all sounds fantastic, but there was a serious downside. The car was incredibly noisy, and to protect their ears, people had to wear similar headwear as though they were in an actual plane. 
Not the best choice for a road trip, but surprisingly, 30 of these were sold. With a shortage of fuel in the 1940s, inventors were trying to find alternate forms of transport. The electric vehicles were looked at again after being left on the drawing board for the past 30 years. So, a brand new electric car, Lof Electric, was designed in 1938 and then built in 1942. It's a three-wheeled egg-shaped vehicle with room for only one passenger. This egg on wheels was powered by a battery pack. One full charge was enough for this little egg to travel up to 63 miles. It could ride along the roads at its top speed of 44 miles per hour. This tiny car was also quite lightweight, only about 770 pounds. I wish I had such a car today. It would squeeze into any parking spot. Yeah. Bonus, there were no blind spots in this car with a 270 degree view around it. But unfortunately, it didn't catch on and only one was ever made. German engineering has always been at a high standard with automobiles and one model, the Amphicar, took them to another level. A car that could also be driven into the water and could function as a boat. While driving at modest speeds on the road, the wheels are slightly lower than normal, but once in the water, the front wheels work as rudders. It could sail at a speed of up to seven knots. The designers were aware that it wasn't the best boat or car, so they advertised it as the best boat driven on the road and the best car to sail on water. It was actually pretty decent as a seaworthy vessel. Many people were surprised that there were no leaks, even if left docked for several hours. It grew in popularity and almost 4,000 vehicles were sold in the 1960s. It even inspired several more models of boat cars in the automobile industry. Have you ever wanted to hire a limousine? What if the limo is crossed with a plane? One guy decided he wanted to combine his love for a 727 plane with the ability to drive it on the road. First, he found a plane. Then he removed the wings and the tail from the body and attached the plane's body to a Mercedes-Benz bus. So it's kinda a regular bus in a plane's disguise. Stretched at 52 feet, it became the biggest limousine in the world. There's enough room for 40 people, but it can still drive at up to 124 miles per hour. The cockpit is mostly preserved. However, a steering wheel was replaced to drive the limo for obvious reasons. The original folding staircase still works, making it a nice welcome to passengers while boarding the Boeing limo. Ooh. Surprisingly, it's registered to be driven on the road, and you can even rent this 24,000 pound limousine. At the beginning of the 20th century, car engines became a lot more efficient, and the availability of affordable gas helped automobiles really kick off. Back in 1927, car designers invented something really posh, Meet Bugatti Royale. It was the most luxurious car ever made. At 21 feet long and weighing 7,000 pounds, almost twice the average weight of a sedan built today. However, at the time of its creation, there was a great decline in the economies around the world. Unfortunately, this lavish car wasn't a success. Even the royalty of Europe had no interest in such an extravagant purchase. 25 had been planned to be made, but as interest faded, only three were sold. The production line ceased with only seven built in the end. The engine design was based on a French aircraft engine and is the largest ever built. But following the failure of the Bugatti Royale, the remaining engines were reused for newly built high-speed rail cars for the French railway system. In 1930, an inventor, John Archibald Purvis, created something he believed will be the high-speed vehicle of the future. He got his inspiration from designs made by Leonardo da Vinci. John felt that the brilliant man was onto something. He then created the Dynosphere, a mono-wheeled vehicle that ran on electricity. This 10 feet high singular wheel made from lattice iron and covered in leather weighed around 1,000 pounds. The driver's seat and the motor are connected and mounted on wheels. At first, steering was only possible when the driver leaned to either side, but later, a steering wheel was implemented to make it easier. It could reach up to 30 miles per hour. 
there was some interest in it as a fun activity for the beach. Ah, and a modified version with eight seats was also made. But unfortunately, the designer's vision of giant wheels covering the highways instead of cars didn't come true. Probably because he has yet to find a way to stop it from moving, other than running into something.